So, where were we? Oh right, after the Treaty of Versailles forced the Weimar Republic to reduce its military, Defense Minister Noske tried to dismiss two of the most powerful Freikorps divisions, but they refused and instead marched into Berlin and took over. The Weimar government was forced to flee and the leader of the coup, Wolfgang Kapp, declared himself Chancellor with support of the old elites of the German Empire. That something's wrong with it. Something is wrong with the left phalange. <laughs> Silly Phoebe, planes oh, don't honey, have phalanges. Sure there's nothing wrong with the plane. All right, look, I have to Help. go. I the love you. are taking over. You are the Weimar Republic's military. You have to do something. Oh, jeez. I'd love to be able to help. I really would. But I'm kind of in the middle of something here. Ross is rushing to the airport to stop Rachel from leaving to Paris forever. Can't you just, like, watch it later? The Freikorps are trying to take over the country. <sighs> Listen, it's not that I don't care or that I never really liked the Weimar government to begin with, but... But? Yeah, I don't really care and I never even liked you guys anyways. The military across Germany either remained neutral or straight up supported the coup, just like the upper echelons of the bureaucracy who longed for their privileges under the empire. But what Kapp's government did not have was support from the workers. Before leaving Berlin, the Weimar government had called for a general strike. The democratic, socialist and communist parties immediately heeded the call and they were not messing around. 12 million workers joined the strike. 12 million. That is one out of every five people in the country. This would become the most powerful worker strike in German history. The country was completely paralyzed. In Berlin, gas, water and power supplies halted entirely. Newspapers stopped printing. Bureaucracy came to a complete standstill. Any sort of long-distance communication was impossible and Kapp and Lütwitz were unable to govern. Trying to consolidate power, Freikorps and the military divisions engaged workers in bloody battles. The military prevailed over the workers in Thuringia and Saxony, while the workers and the Red Army won in the roar. A former soldier by the name of Adolf Hitler, eager to help the coup, flew to Berlin to meet with the organizers, but by the time he arrived, the coup had already collapsed. The Weimar government returned and the coup plotters escaped Germany with help from the police. But after the putsch collapsed, workers in the Ruhr did not stop striking. Workers had been responsible for saving the government. Many had died in the fighting and now they wanted something in return. They demanded better wages and improved worker conditions, as well as the retreat from all remaining Freikorps. Okay, so we agree. The government will pardon any legal acts committed in resistance to the Kapp Putsch, but you will cooperate with us in disarming the Red Army. That works for me, thank you so much for your... Hey boss, check this out. These dummies are not even fighting back. <laughs> While workers negotiated with the government, a military commander acting on his own brutally suppressed the strikes, leading to even bigger strikes and the termination of negotiations. Now a combination of Reichswehr and Freikorps, including units that had participated in Kapp's coup, moved against the Red Army. By the end of the fighting, the Red Army was defeated. Reichswehr and Freikorps lost a combined total of around 500 lives, while an estimated 1000 workers were killed. The Ruhr Uprising was a clear demonstration of the power and unity of Germany's working class. It also showed clearly how the German government was consistently willing to exert violence to preserve the power and privilege of the ruling class. Germany became even more polarized. After the end of the fighting, Germany finally went through a period of relative peace and by that I mean that there were just no coup attempts, at least for now. But political assassinations were incredibly frequent and they were carried out almost exclusively by right-wing extremists to left-wing politicians. Matthias Erzberger, who played a central role in negotiating and signing the Treaty of Versailles, was assassinated. Walter Rathenau, a Jewish foreign minister who was trying to improve relations with the Soviet Union, was also assassinated by an anti-socialist anti-Semite. Between 1918 and 1922, there were at least 376 assassinations, 354 of them, were linked to far-right extremists. Of those cases, only 18 were ever prosecuted. And only one of those prosecuted was one of the right-wing assassins. 
If you thought things in Germany were dire at this point, well, think again. Because during World War I, Germany paid for the war effort by consciously inflating the war economy, which was actually a common thing. Britain, France and the US did this too. And after winning, they went through a readjustment period, which meant a recession, unemployment, all of which is common in the transition from a wartime to a peacetime economy. But the Weimar authorities didn't believe they could afford this transition, so they continued with the wartime policies. This meant that in the short term, they had more money to spend for progressive social and welfare policies. But eventually, there would be a reckoning. In January 1923, Germany was unable to pay their war debt, and France declared Germany in default. French and Belgian troops marched into the Rhineland and took control of most of its mining and manufacturing companies for about two years. We can't just let them take all our resources, we're already broke! Don't worry, I have an incredible idea. They can't take our resources if we don't produce any. But how will we eat? And how will I pay for my super yachts? I have rights, you know? Don't worry, we will pay for all your expenses so that you don't feel a thing. But how would we pay for that? No. No. Don't do it. Don't print more money. In 1919, one dollar was worth 14 marks. By 1921, it was 1 to 64. By January 1922, it was 1 to 191. One year later, it was 1 to 17,972. In August of the same year, one US dollar was worth 109,996 marks. And in November 1923, just a few months later, one US dollar was worth 1 trillion 420 billion marks. The cost of a loaf of bread went from 3 marks in 1922 to 80 billion Reichsmark in November 1923. To be able to survive, workers were paid 3 times a day. They were paid immediately upon arrival and brought someone along with them. That person would receive the money and go buy lunch. This had to be done quickly because by lunchtime, the money they had received that same morning would have become worthless. At lunch, they did the same for dinner, but they were safe in the afternoon once the markets were closed. As a consequence of inflation, millions lost their life savings, crime surged, and many opted to end their lives. But people being forced to immediately spend any money they earned meant that young people learned to buy and trade in foreign stocks, finding some sort of financial stability. This became so widespread that almost every newspaper, no matter how small, now included the latest news on the stock market. But with hyperinflation, civil discontent surged once again. Charismatic leaders sprung up across Germany, each of them promising to be the solution to the nation's problems. One claimed the solution to be singing and praying. Another one claimed the solution to be the eradication of the German Jewish population. That man's name, as you may have guessed, was Adolf Hitler. Let's rewind a little bit. Hitler had been working as a sort of spy for the army, charged with investigating newly formed parties. In 1919, he was tasked with infiltrating a party called the German Workers' Party, which his superiors believed could be socialist. However, to Hitler's surprise, the party was not only not socialist, but actually a fiercely nationalist and anti-socialist organization. Hitler soon joined and rose to the top thanks to his passionate and powerful rhetoric. But the party was still small. Realizing that a large portion of the German population was now identifying either with socialist or hyper-nationalist ideals, they came up with a clever plan. They renamed their party the National Socialist German Workers' Party, a name that was deliberately contradicting, looking to lure in as many people as possible. In German, a socialist is called Sozialist. So conservatives and right-wingers tended to use the abbreviated form Sozi as a pejorative for the Sozialisten. As the NSDAP members began to use this pejorative, socialists retaliated by using a similarly sounding pejorative, Nazi. However, as time went on, the term gained popularity and eventually became the mainstream nickname for party members and its adherents. Nazis were not shy about their goal, to end German democracy, which they viewed as the root of their misery, and punish those who had brought it upon them, Jews and real socialists. In November 1923, inspired by what Mussolini had done in Italy a year prior, Hitler led a group of Nazis and Brownshirts, the party's paramilitary group, to the Bavarian Defense Ministry. Famous World War I General Erich Ludendorff joined them, dressed in his full military uniform. Stop right there, or we will shoot! 
We will not stop. You will have to shoot us. Well, okay then. While Hitler and his conspirators run away, Ludendorff continued his march. No soldier dared to fire at the renowned general, and he reached the soldiers unharmed. He was greeted cordially, and the soldiers even apologized as they arrested him. Hitler was arrested and tried, but once again, the conservative judiciary was incredibly lenient. Many of Hitler's co-conspirators pleaded not guilty and were quickly released. Hitler, however, wished to use his trial to make a spectacle and refused to plead not guilty. If overthrowing a government made of November criminals is high treason, then I am guilty. If wanting to restore the majesty of the German Reich is treason, then I am guilty. If trying to restore the honor of the German army is high treason, then I am guilty. You get the point. He was only sentenced to five years with the possibility of early pardon, and he was released after only eight months. Prison did little more than give him time to write his famous book and made his name known across Germany. The NSDAP was banned, but continued to operate under a different name. In late 1923, the German government was finally able to control inflation. They cut off credit, quadrupled interest rates, laid off 750,000 white-collar employees, as well as 150,000 civil servants who thought had lifelong tenures. So even though they solved one of Germany's biggest problems, their reputation only worsened. Still, the period between 1924 and 1928 was one of relative stability. The economy grew and the country faced relatively little civil unrest. In the meantime, Hitler managed to get the ban on his party lifted, and in 1928, the SDAP entered their first elections since 1924. Although they only got 2% of the votes, they did manage to get 12 seats in parliament. Soon after, Goebbels became head of propaganda. He changed the plan, identify a particular subject, and then throw all the leaflets and pamphlets into it. They wanted to focus on small towns where other parties were absent and leave a mark. They just needed something to happen to anger the population and then they would be ready to prey on their fears. German economic stability relied heavily on US investments and loans. If anything happened and these American short-term loans were withdrawn, it would be in deep trouble. Bye, bye, bye! Oh god, I love capitalism! We can speculate endlessly without any repercussions! I know, right? The market would grow forever! Bye, bye! Um, but what if it doesn't? <gasps> sell, sell, sell! The US economy crashed in 1929 and it took the fragile German economy down with it. To make matters worse, the last elections left no clear majorities in the Reichstag and Heinrich Brünning, a Catholic center politician, became chancellor. He basically said to the German public, the only way out of this depression is for us to tighten our belts. We need to balance the budget, cut government expenditures, and that may mean getting rid of unemployment insurance. It may mean cutting way back into the expensive Weimar social welfare programs. And it means we're going to see a way of layoffs and raise taxes. No. Come on. No. Please. No. Pretty please? No. Pretty please with a cherry on top? No. Brüning insisted that this was the right thing to do, but no one wanted to take responsibility for such unpopular measures, and he had no support from the Reichstag. Thus, Brüning made use of Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution. With his emergency powers, Brüning dissolved parliament and called for new elections. This was a catastrophic mistake. All mainstream parties had been responsible for some part of Germany's problems, either signing the armistice, failing to solve inflation, or the harsh stabilization that came after. But the NSDAP was not. They had never been in power, and thus they were not to blame for any of the political problems. And they were ready to take full advantage of it. They relentlessly hammered at the faults of other parties in a campaign run by Goebbels, who created a network of informants who sat in public places and listened to people's worries. Goebbels then used that information to create propaganda specifically designed for each group. The propaganda would often be contradictory. They appealed to Catholics and Protestants, to workers and business people, to farmers and white-collar workers. No other party did anything like this. To Goebbels and the NSDAP, the message was not important. The only thing that mattered to them was to win the election and to end the democratic government, which they openly stated. 
After the elections, the NSDAP emerged with 18% of their votes and made them the second largest party behind only the Social Democrats. With their success, coalition forming in the government was impossible and Brüning, refusing to change his policies, continued to govern exclusively using Article 48. We need to cut fiscal spending. No, Article 48. We need to lay off a few hundred thousand people. No, Article 48. Excuse me, sir, do you have any idea how fast you were going? Article 48. Hey, son, it's already midnight. You can't play games all night. You have to go to sleep. Article 48. Brüning introduced unpopular legislation by using Article 48 a total of a hundred times between 1930 and 1932. This was the beginning of the end of German democracy. And the Nazis didn't just go away after elections. More campaigning meant more members. More members meant more money. More money meant more propaganda campaigns. Propaganda became a self-financing operation. Confident in his support, Hitler decided to challenge the 85-year-old Hindenburg for the presidency in the 1932 elections. The Nazi launched a massive media blitz unparalleled in German history. Over 30,000 rallies, meetings and demonstrations, millions of leaflets were distributed. Speakers toured the country where the propaganda machine worked at full speed. Every week they put out a new set of talks and leaflets and had members assess how well they were received. They would then adapt future campaigns based on what was most effective at persuading certain demographics. They even had NSDAP public servants send individually written letters to certain people. Nothing like this had ever been done before. The brown shirts were critical in this period, organizing marches and handing out leaflets and, of course, intimidating political opponents. Hitler flew to almost every major city in Germany, often speaking in several cities in one day. The preparation, build-up and execution very often resembled modern rock concerts. But despite all this, Hitler lost the election to Hindenburg. Still, he demanded to be appointed chancellor. In tradition, he should have been. But Hindenburg despised him, so he refused. At this point, the Nazis were finally taken seriously by other parties and big businesses, who saw them as a way to destroy socialist and communist movements. After a disagreement with Brüning, Hindenburg called for new elections and Brüning was replaced by Franz von Papen. Papen wished to appeal to businesses and the old aristocracy. He lowered taxes for the wealthy and wages for workers, while also defunding welfare programs. All of this, of course, exclusively using Article 48. He called for new elections, believing he could gain over support from Nazis. This was another massive miscalculation. Nazis received 38% of the vote. Now, the majority of the parliament was opposed to its own existence and sessions in the Reichstag no longer took place. As political action became once again impossible, elections were held again in November to break the stalemate. But this time, Nazi popularity dropped. They had claimed to be the solution, yet being the largest party failed to implement any actual policies. Hindenburg appointed as Chancellor Kurt von Schleicher, who, just like Papen, thought he could win over followers away from Hitler. But both of them failed, and by January 1933, it had become clear that the government was once again failing. Unable to govern, Hindenburg reached an agreement with Hitler. The Nazi party agreed to form a coalition with the conservatives, thus gaining a majority in the Reichstag, and he was appointed chancellor. Now that he had finally become chancellor, Hitler was ready to undo the democratic government. And he would begin purging those who had opposed him, communists and socialists. During the night of February 27th, the German parliament was set on fire. Take a moment to picture the impact this would have. Imagine how people would react if one night the US Congress was burned down. The NSDAP framed communists for the fire and Hitler convinced Hindenburg that they were trying to overthrow them. Hindenburg agreed to issue the Reichstag Fire Decree, which nullified key civil liberties, including the right to speak, assemble, protest and due process. In practice, it allowed Nazis to imprison anyone they considered to be a threat and to suppress publications unfriendly to their cause. Hitler still claimed that he did not have enough power to stop the alleged communist threat. The only way to stop the very real and totally not made up communist plot to destroy all of us is to pass an act that enables me to bypass you guys and that dum dum Hindenburg. So who's in favor? I knew I could count on you, my conservatives and nationalists. But what about the rest? We need more votes. No one else? 
How about we take that vote again? We are still just one vote short. Hey Jakob, how is that pretty wife of yours doing, huh? I saw her yesterday, you know? She was picking up your two little kids. Oh, how cute they are. It would be such a shame if something were to happen to them. In March, the government began sending communists, socialists and worker union leaders to the first concentration camp in Dachau. By July, all other parties had either been outlawed or intimidated into dissolving, and Germany officially became a one-party state. Hitler's dictatorship was almost consolidated. There remained but one problem. The German army worried that it might be absorbed by the SA, led by Ernst Röhm. Starting June 30, 1934, Hitler had many of his political opponents and even some of his own followers executed. During the Night of the Long Knives, the final remnants of resistance to the NSDAP dictatorship were eliminated, including the few real socialists within the party. And finally, on August 2, 1934, President Hindenburg died of old age. Hitler combined the offices of President and Chancellor into one and took the title of Führer. During his dictatorship, Hitler not only brutally persecuted minorities, but also annihilated worker unions by replacing them with the German Worker Front. Socialist movements were eradicated as the German Führer consolidated capitalist hold over the German economy. And so, a revolution that started with dreams and aspirations of a fair and democratic Germany ended in one of the worst tyrannies of recent times, which would soon lead to the atrocities of the Holocaust and World War II.